I'm Paul Garner with Biblical Creation Trust and this is part two of our look at the evidence of the biblical flood in the geology of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Partway through the flood there was a further episode of compression and uplift associated with the assembly of the supercontinent Pangaea resulting in what's known as the Variscan orogeny. In northern England a huge sheet-like intrusion of igneous rock was in place, the Great Wind Sill, whose dolerite outcrops today extend for almost 200 miles. Its eroded escarpment was exploited by the Romans in the second century, when Hadrian's Wall was built along the top to defend their territory from the northern Picts. Slightly younger is the enormous granite batholith that underlies southwest England, the hydrothermal fluids associated with the cooling granite magma deposited vast quantities of ore minerals such as tin, copper, lead and zinc in the fractured rocks around the intrusion. Polonium radio halos are abundant in these rocks, as shown by Dr Andrew Snelling's analysis of samples that I sent to him from the Land's End granite in Cornwall. The presence of these radio halos suggests remarkably short timescales for the emplacement and cooling of the host granite bodies. And the complexity of the tectonics associated with these orogenic events can be seen in many places in southwest England. For example, at Boss Castle on the north coast of Cornwall, where there are folds in the rocks that have been folded again by later earth movements. And at nearby Millock Haven, there's a particularly dramatic example of tight chevron folds in carboniferous turbidites exposed in the towering cliffs. Next we come to the Permian. At a number of localities in England and Scotland, Permian sandstones with large sweeping crossbeds can be observed, some very reminiscent of the Coconino sandstone and other cross-bedded Permian sands of the southwestern United States. And like their American counterparts, these sandstones are usually interpreted as sand dune deposits that accumulated in ancient deserts, an obvious challenge to the flood model. However, research led by Dr John Whitmore at Cedarville University suggests that this interpretation is mistaken and that these sandstones in fact accumulated as giant underwater sand waves during the flood. John and I spent many hours together in the field, not only in the southwestern United States, but also sampling these Permian sandstones in Britain and under the microscope they have a great deal in common with the Coconino. These cross-bedded sandstones may represent a time during the flood when the ocean waters were encroaching on the land and reworking the coastal dunes of the pre-flood world. In southern Britain, the base of the succeeding Triassic is marked by the development of pebble beds such as these on the left at Budley Salterton in Devon. They testify to high energy conditions with some pebbles probably having been transported from Brittany in western France. The pebble beds are followed by sandstones, and then the Mercia mudstones, whose outcrops comprise distinctive red and green marls like those on the right. These sediments would be quite familiar to anyone who knows the Moan Kopi and Chin Li formations of the southwestern United States, or the Triassic rocks of the eastern United States we're again reminded of how widespread these patterns of sedimentation can be, an observation readily explained by the global flood model. One of Britain's geological jewels is the Jurassic Coast, a stretch of the Dorset and East Devon coastline designated as a World Heritage Site in 2002. This is a favourite place for fossil collectors. Ammonites and belemnites are abundant, and important finds of marine reptiles such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs have been made here. Before the flood, these animals probably inhabited the warm, shallow waters of extensive inland seas. 
Jurassic rocks are also exposed on the coast of North Yorkshire, where field evidences are indicative of high energy environments, active tectonics and rapid sedimentation rates. Then we come to the Cretaceous. The lower Cretaceous rocks of southern England are often referred to as the Wealdon, after the area of Sussex and Kent, where they've been particularly well studied. These rocks preserve the remains of terrestrial ecosystems, dominated by horsetail trees and dinosaurs such as Iguanodon. On the left you can see a dinosaur footprint in the Wealdon sediments of the Isle of Wight, just off the south coast. Above the Wealdon sediments, in the Upper Cretaceous, there are extensive deposits of chalk, comprised of the shells of billions of tiny marine plankton called coccolithophores. The famous white cliffs of England's southern coastline must be among the most iconic chalk exposures anywhere in the world. However, similar Cretaceous chalks can be found in several North American states, they underlie much of Northwest Europe, and can even be traced into Israel, Egypt and Western Australia. It seems that at this point during the flood, conditions were just right for the explosive development of planktonic blooms across vast swathes of the planet. And these Cretaceous chalks are probably the last deposits of the flood proper in Great Britain. Around the end of the flood, uplift in the northwest caused much of the chalk previously deposited there to be eroded away. We know the chalk was once present there because small remnants can be found, such as the blocks of chalk fortuitously preserved by a collapsing volcano on the Scottish island of Arran. In the southeast of England, which was experiencing subsidence, the London clay was deposited, preserving a variety of plant and animal remains that suggest a warm tropical environment. However, fossils in younger post-flood sediments, in the London and Hampshire basins and in East Anglia, suggest that the climate was cooling and drying out, with the spread of grasslands and the growth of oak and beech forests. Also in the early post-flood period, southern Britain experienced the marginal effects of the uplift of the Alps to the south, leading to the development of folds such as the famous Lulworth Crumple that you can see on the left at Stair Hole in Dorset. Meanwhile, Scotland and Northern Ireland were experiencing major outpourings of basalt lava, associated with the final stages of the opening of the North Atlantic. The cooling and cracking of the basalt flows created the dramatic polygonal columns of the Giant's Causeway in County Antrim in Northern Ireland. As the climate continued to cool, mountain glaciers grew in the north, eventually coalescing into ice sheets that surged out across lowland Britain. Glacial sediments and scratch marks, perched boulders, and over-deepened U-shaped valleys all testify to the former presence of the post-flood ice sheets. We also see the first evidence of human occupation, the oldest being the stone tools and footprints found at Haysborough in Norfolk on the east coast of England. The people who made these tools and left these footprints were among the first to colonise these islands after the flood. In fact, the Haysborough footprints discovered in 2013 are currently considered the oldest human footprints outside Africa. Well, that really was a whistle-stop tour. And I'm sure that those who are familiar with the geology of Britain and Northern Ireland will be wincing at my oversimplifications and all the things I had to leave out. But I hope I've given you enough to whet your appetite and to see that there's more to flood geology than the Grand Canyon, fascinating though the canyon is. We're very fortunate in these islands to have such a complete sampling of the geological record in one relatively compact geographical area. Every geological system from the Ediacaran onwards is represented here, 
And so it's no surprise that the pioneering field geologists of the 19th century were able to work out so much of the geological column within our shores. And as we examine the rocks and fossils of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, we see many evidences consistent with the biblical flood model. Earth-shattering tectonics, catastrophic volcanism, rapid sedimentation and the mass mortality of organisms. It's also instructive to see how so many of the patterns that we perceive in the rock layers here in Britain can also be perceived elsewhere in the world, including in North America. There are many obvious parallels. The crystalline basement, the Great Unconformity, Cambrian quartzites, Carboniferous limestones and coals, Permian sandstones with giant crossbeds, Cretaceous chalks and so on. The geological column is real and it's consistent across continents. Of course, global scale patterns such as these demand a global scale explanation. And the Bible gives us that explanation in its account of the worldwide flood in the days of Noah.